Australians work hard at their Order. jobs. Senator Urquhart, you will be in continuation on the resumption cool. of debate. Questions without notice. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr uh, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This morning, speaking about COVID vaccines, Senator Canavan called for the Morrison government to, and I quote, suspend the rollout here in Australia. Does Senator Canavan's position represent the government's position? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President, and thank uh, Senator for his question. Uh, Mr President, uh, Senator Canavan's position does not represent the government's position. I mean, I, I, acknowledge, I acknowledge the comments Order. from Senator Canavan, uh, Mr. President, and I acknowledge his right to have a perspective, to have a view on these things, Mr. President. I, I acknowledge his his perspective. But, Mr. President, as we have done, as we have done all the way Order. through this pandemic, all the way as we have done all the way through this pandemic, Mr. President, we. Mr. President, are taking the health advice with respect to the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, over recent days, with respect to the concerns that have been raised and the suspension of the vaccination rollout in a number of countries in Europe, uh, our health agencies, particularly the TGA, have been in close contact with those agencies. Uh, those agencies in Europe uh, to, understand what is, to understand what is occurring, Mr President, and also, Mr President, to assure ourselves that the vaccination rollout is safe to continue with, Mr President. And the TGA has issued a statement to that effect uh, to indicate that the, the uh, vaccination rollout is safe to continue with. Uh, the uh, Mr. President, the uh, ATAGI has issued a statement with respect to the rollout that it is uh, safe to continue with, and Mr. President, as has the Chief Medical Officer, who has issued a statement with relation to the safety of the rollout. Mr. President, so we will continue. We will continue to act on the health of health advice. Order, Senator Colbert, uh, in the time safe for the answer of has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This morning, the Treasurer rejected Senator Canavan's calls to suspend the rollout, saying, and I quote, they have now not found any causal link between the vaccine and blood clots. Yet 10 minutes ago, Senator Canavan doubled down on his comments in a tweet. Who are the Australian people supposed to believe, Treasurer Frydenberg or Senator Canavan? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I would urge the, Tas the Australian people, the Tasmanian people too, the Australian Order. people to follow the advice that's been given to us by our world-leading health agencies, the TGA, one of the best agencies of its kind in the world. And I would urge the Australian people to follow that advice, Order. Mr. President. I would urge the Australian people Order. to follow the advice of the. Chief Medical Officer, Professor Senator Watt. Kelly, and I would urge the Australian people to follow the advice Senator Watt. of ATAGI, Mr. President. So all of these agencies, uh, including the Chief Medical Officer, have issued statement saying that there has been no causal link found between blood clotting and uh, the vaccine, uh, and that it is safe to continue with the rollout, Mr. President. The the, all of those agencies are in close contact Order, with Senator their sister Colbeck. agencies in Europe. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Senator Canavan's comments risk undermining confidence in Australia's health regulators. It would appear Senator Abetz might agree. And in the rollout of the, of the COVID-19 vaccination program, has this minister, the Minister for Health or the Prime Minister, addressed with Senator Canavan the comments he made this morning? And if not, why not? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, uh, I am aware of a conversation between uh, the Prime Minister and uh, the uh, Health Minister and Min uh, Senator Canavan uh, during a forum this morning where this matter was debated. Uh, so, Mr President, the views of the Prime Minister and the Health Minister are well known. 
are well known, Mr. President, to Senator Canavan. And Mr. President, I would urge, I would Order. urge, Mr. President, the Australian Order. people to take the world-leading advice, the world-leading advice of the TGA, ATAGI, and the CMO, Mr. President. I would urge the Australian people to follow that advice. In fact, I would urge all my colleagues to follow that advice because that is the thing that will remain retain confidence in the rollout of the Order vaccine in this land. country, which is Order. so important to us from a health perspective. It's so important to us from an economic perspective that we continue Order. to safely roll out the vaccine in this country in the support of all Australians. Order. Before I order on my left, before I come to you, Senator Patterson, I'd like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Japan to Australia, His Excellency Mr Yamagami Shingo. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's participation in the Quad Leaders Summit? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Qu Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Patterson, for his question. It is timely indeed that His Excellency is in the uh, gallery today for, uh, for this uh, question. Uh, because, Mr. President, on Saturday I was uh, pleased to join the Prime Minister for the first Quad Leaders meeting, which followed the third Quad Foreign Ministers meeting in February. The Quad brings together four like minded democracies Australia, India, Japan and the United States, united by a shared vision for a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. The Leaders' Summit was an historic moment that reinforces our support for a sovereign, resilient and stable Indo-Pacific. President Biden, Prime Ministers Morrison, Modi and Suga have set an ambitious, practical and positive agenda for key regional priorities. As the Prime Minister said at the beginning of the summit, history teaches us that when nations engage together in a partnership of strategic trust, of common hope and shared values, much can be achieved. This supports Australia's strategic interests, reflecting our belief in a region governed by rules, not by power. Through the Quad, Australia works with our close partners to support a region based on sovereignty and respect for international law. The Quad complements Australia's engagement in ASEAN-led, ASEAN-centred architecture and other bilateral, regional and multilateral groupings. All four Quad countries are strongly committed to ASEAN centrality as well as the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific and to working with regional Order. partners to ensure a prosperous and secure region. Australia looks to our friends in achieving these goals, but Mr. President, we don't leave it to our friends. As our response to COVID-19 demonstrates, Order. Australia Payne, will do our time share of for the, the lifting. Answer has expired. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is Australia working with our key partners to secure and distribute COVID-19 vaccines in the Pacific and Southeast Asia? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. And in the spirit, indeed, of our important response to the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, Quad leaders launched a landmark partnership on Saturday to support our region's recovery from COVID-19. Together, we're taking action to expand safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing and delivery in 2021. Reflecting our respective strengths, our investments will ramp up vaccine manufacturing capacity, fund the procurement and distribution of vaccines and provide last mile delivery support. Building on the government's existing commitment of a $523 million uh, regional vaccine access and health security program, Australia has pledged an additional $100 million to be allocated in consultation between Quad partners. Wherever possible, Quad partners will take opportunities to implement joint or closely coordinated programs of support for our partner countries in the Indo-Pacific, with a particular focus Order. on Southeast Senator Asia. Payne. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will the Quad framework assist to deepen Australia's cooperation with India, Japan and the US on key emerging issues in our region? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I want to note, Mr. President, that uh, Quad leaders in particular underscored that climate change is a global priority and, of course, a risk to Indo-Pacific resilience. 
We have established a new quad climate working group to strengthen climate action and advance the low emissions technology required to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible. We have also established a critical and emerging technology working group recognising that a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific requires that critical technology is governed according At to the shared rear of the interests chamber. and values. That builds on the Quad's existing agenda, agreed by foreign ministers at our own meeting in Tokyo last October. And that agenda includes cooperation on maritime security, on infrastructure, on supply chain resilience, on counter-terrorism, on cyber and on countering disinformation. I particularly look forward to taking forward this important work with my counterparts, Indian External Affairs Minister Joshanka, Japanese Foreign Minister Order. Motegi Senator and US Payne, Secretary of State Blinken. Answer has expired. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. On the treatment of women in the parliament, the Minister for Women has said, and I quote, the only way it will change is if we, as parliamentarians, own the problems own the failings and make the necessary changes. Attorney General Porter has sat on the Respect at Work report for a year, responding to only three of the 55 recommendations. Will the Minister for Women call on the Attorney General to own his failings and make the necessary changes to implement the remaining 52 recommendations one year on? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the government has taken a number of steps to address a uh, component of the recommendations addressed to the Commonwealth. Those Order. recommendations were outlined in the Women's Economic Security Statement process through the budget, Mr President, and the government is actively considering the remaining recommendations in detail with a view to con continuing to implement that response as soon as possible this year. I want to acknowledge the work that's being done by Senator the Hon. Amanda Stoker, the new Assistant yeah. Minister yeah. to the Attorney General. Uh, in that regard. Of course, Mr President, Order. additionally, Safe Work Australia has been doing very important work in this, in this uh, space, including by releasing its sexual harassment in the workplace guidance earlier this year. Uh, I would also, Mr President, um, uh, refer to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's uh, words in relation uh, to the report, uh, acknowledging, and as I did, in fact, in a question asked of me recently also, that COVID did along with a number of, in, a number of matters Order. before government at the time, did have an impact on this process, that a number of the key recommendations have been funded, in particular looking at the next survey, uh, getting together the Workplace Sexual Harassment Council and some education and training resources. I do want to note, Mr Order. President, and those opposite seek to ignore this, but I do think it is actually important to acknowledge that as a, as a report about workplaces, the um, report's recommendations are not limited to government alone. While the government naturally has had to direct its resources to immediate priorities, I think the Commissioner has also been encouraged in the level of influence she's seeing the report have in workplaces, uh, the main subject of its concern over the past year. And I said in response to a question last week, and Order. I'm not sure from whom that question came, Mr President, but I did say in response to a question last week or the week before that Senator the report Keneally. also involves other governments, Mr President, plus business in particular, and a number of agencies, including Safe Work that I've already referred to, Fair Work Australia. Order. It Senator is not Payne. an entirely Commonwealth government-led report. Has expired. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Does the Minister for Women consider it appropriate that the Attorney General Mr Porter, remain the Cabinet Minister responsible for the Respect at Work report. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the Attorney-General, who, uh, uh, who is currently on a period of leave, the Acting Attorney-General, Minister Cash, uh, here in this chamber, the Attorney-General has outlined uh, very clearly his position in relation to uh, the issues to which Senator McAllister alludes. Mr President, this country operates on the basis of the rule of law and the presumption of innocence. And it is not possible Order. to be selective Order. about to whom that should and should not apply. The Attorney-General has initiated certain proceedings of his Pratt. own motion in relation to a number Senators of these matters. And Watt. I would also note, um, Mr President, as I have Order. said in this chamber pre Watt. previously and as I have made clear again today, that in relation to the Respect at Work report, that work is being carried out by the newly appointed 
Uh, Assistant Minister, Senator the Honourable Amanda Stoker. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. In both of her answers to date and previously when asked about this report, this minister has deferred responsibility to the junior assisting minister, Senator Stoker. Will the Minister for Women listen to Australian women, step up and take responsibility for doing her bit to ensure that the 55 recommendations are finally implemented? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. There's a number of issues uh, that have been raised, including through um, the terms of the uh uh, petition presented to the parliament yesterday, uh, and they did uh, support the adoption of the 55 recommendation in the Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report. I've already indicated that those are being considered, Mr. President, through the appropriate portfolio minister, actually, Mr. President. And in terms of uh, of, it, of recommendations that Order. I was able to address, Minister, those recommendations Order were addressed, left. including with funding, in the Women's Economic Security Statement in October last year. Uh, so the uh, full response, as I said, will be brought forward by the Assistant Minister to the Attorney General, Senator Stoker. But there's a number of recommendations, Mr President. For example, the ratification of the ILO's Convention on Eliminating Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. Well, if you knew anything about the implementation of such matters, Senator Keeley, then you would know that the government's approach Order, to ratifying Senator treaties Payne. is Order, now, Senator Payne. now consistent Time for the answer with us. Has expired. Order. I was struggling to hear the minister during that answer. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday marked the two-year anniversary of the far-right terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand, when an Australian man killed 51 innocent Muslims. On 9th December 2020, following the publication of the New Zealand Royal Commission report, I asked you, Minister, whether the Prime Minister had read the report and how the government intended to respond to it. You gave me a commitment that the government will examine the report thoroughly, all 44 of its recommendations, engage with the New Zealand government on how it is implementing the recommendations and consider any and all implications for the operation of our own counterterrorism policies and practices. More than three months have passed, Minister. Has the Prime Minister read the report? Has the government spoken with the New Zealand counterparts about it? And when will the Australian government respond to the report? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Well, the very important work that Senator Faruqi identifies in terms of the response to right-wing extremism, uh, to extremism in all its forms where it poses a threat uh, to the safety or social cohesion uh, of Australia, uh, is an ongoing piece of work that our government has taken seriously for many years and continues to take very seriously, including in relation to learning the lessons from the tragic Christchurch massacre uh, and learning from the elements of the New Zealand report and investigations that are relevant to Australia. Uh, and our government agencies, in relation to their responses and the advice that they will provide as to what further or additional steps need to be taken in Australia, uh, will absolutely draw upon uh, that work uh, as we draw upon all expert evidence in relation to such important matters. Uh, just in the, uh, the last budget, uh, our government provided a further $571 million over the next five years to our security agencies to keep Australians safe. These are the security agencies that Senator Faruqi rightly quotes in terms of having identified areas of rise in right-wing extremism that we need to confront, uh, as well as having identified other areas of extremism that we need to confront. These agencies, ASIO in particular, has the highest level of funding in its 70-year history. And this year's budget, uh, our government uh, has invested and continues to invest some $300 million to enhance the AFP's capacity to respond to emerging threats. There's no place in our community, no place in our community, for any group or individual who order. seeks Senator to promote Birmingham, disharmony. I've got Senator Faruqi on a point of order. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, point of order is to relevance. I really ask specifically about the New Zealand Royal Commission report. Has the Prime Minister read it? And when will the government respond? Um, I, I, you, that was definitely the final part of your question, Senator Faruqi. It was a long question. Um, I've allowed you to remind the Minister of that. Um, the Minister has 14 seconds remaining. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr President. The New Zealand report was not a report to the Australian government, but it is a valued input in terms of an additional source of information that will inform the continued investment and policy making our government makes in relation to these important issues. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, government MPs have repeatedly sought to draw false equivalences between right-wing and left-wing extremism. In its recent submission to the PJCIS inquiry into extremism, ASIO states that the threat from extreme right-wing groups has increased, with groups being more organized and sophisticated than before. Conversely, on left-wing extremism, ASIO states that it is not currently prominent in Australia. Will government MPs stop drawing false equivalences between extreme right-wing and left-wing groups? The question has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, the laws, the policy, the funding, the operation of our security agencies are ideologically agnostic. Whether extremism is right-wing extremism, whether it is religiously motivated extremism, whatever the cause of such extremism, we focus very clearly on dealing with those Order. threats, dealing with the potential criminality, dealing with the risks to Australia. Prevention initiatives that are supported across the country in terms of tackling areas of extremist ideology. Now, I'll take Senator Keneally's intervention. The ideology matters in relation to dealing with the threats and seeking to minimise them. But there is not a singular ideology that poses a threat uh, to Australia. Uh, if you sit down and ask our Order. security agencies, they will tell you that, Senator Keneally. The threats of religious extremism, the threats of right-wing extremism Order. remain Senator very Birmingham. real, very Time significant for the has and expired. are expired. Senator Keneally. Sen Senator Keneally. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, will the government condemn far-right extremism without equivocation? Yes or no? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as I have done before in this chamber. I condemn right-wing right extremism without any qualification. I condemn religious extremism without any qualification. I condemn all forms of extremism that pose threat or violence or undermine safety without any form of qualification. I acknowledge absolutely the work of ASIO, as I have done in this chamber before, and it is as a result of the record funding and investment and legislative approaches this government has put in place that agencies like ASIO have been in a position to identify those threats, to work to respond to those threats, and that we will continue to support them without any qualification and without any bias towards the threats that are posed to Australia to make sure that they are empowered to continue to do so. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to Minister Hume, representing the Minister for Communications. The pandemic crisis has been a time of heightened stress, anxiety and depression, and has worsened gambling addiction in vulnerable Australians. Online bookies have made a killing during the pandemic. In Australia, credit cards can be used when gambling online, but credit cards cannot be used offline in a licensed gambling venue or casino. The UK banned the use of credit cards for both online and offline betting in April last year, recognising that this will significantly reduce the extent of harm to vulnerable people. Why does the Morrison government still allow online betting with credit cards and not legislate to ban the practice as the UK has done? The Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure and the Arts, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Griff, for your question and for your ongoing commitment to vulnerable Australians, in particular in areas of problem gambling. Uh, you're correct. Uh, uh, last year, the UK uh, have banned gamblers um, from using credit cards to pay for bets, and that's for both online and offline gambling. And it also applies to, uh, to e-wallets, which is a new pattern that we're seeing emerging in paying for online betting. Uh, in the name of consumer protection, that's been particularly because of evidence and anecdote of uh, online gambling has increased throughout uh, the period of coronavirus in the UK, and there's also anecdotal evidence that that has occurred in Australia as well. Now, as you'd know, 
regulation of gambling and gaming is predominantly a state-based responsibility. However, the government is always interested to learn what's being done in other jurisdictions to protect vulnerable communities. And there's no doubt that digital technologies uh, like e-wallets are rapidly changing the way that people choose to gamble. In November 2018, the Coalition Government, in conjunction with state and territory governments, launched the National Consumer Protection Framework for online wagering in Australia to provide much stronger con consumer protections for Australians who are gambling online. And they included things like prohibition of online wagering services from offering credit, uh, to providing credit to people who gamble on their site or on an app. It included things like prohibition of use of payday lenders uh, for online betting. It required customer verification requirements, restrictions on inducement and account closures, including voluntary opt-out pre-commitment schemes, activity statements and Order. consistent gambling messages, as well as staff training and the National Inclusion Register. Now, the Commonwealth will be responsible for implementing measures such as this new online national self-exclusion register, which allows people to self-exclude from all online Order. wagering Senator sites Hume, and apps time in one the answer vote. has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you are correct with gambling falling under states, but credit cards fall under federal, so that's where uh, it's appropriate that it's dealt with here. Now, last year I introduced legislation to ban the use of credit cards for online gambling. I wrote to the Minister for Communications on the issue, and his response was, and I'll quote, the implementation of a ban on the use of credit cards to deposit funds into online wagering accounts is not currently within the scope of the Morrison government's online gambling reforms. End of quote. Why is such a reform not Order, within the Senator scope? Order, Senator Griff. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator Griff. I can say to you that uh, in December 2019, the Australian Bankers Association, the ABA, released a consultation paper seeking the views of the public on exactly this issue, the use of credit cards in gambling, and submissions to that process closed in March last year. Now, Minister Fletcher and Minister Rustin, as the relevant ministers, uh, are due to meet with the ABA on this very issue in the coming weeks. As I said before, the state and territory governments have the primary responsibility for the regulation and licensing of providers and the premises also in which uh, gambling products are available. And the government will continue to monitor this issue to determine whether government intervention is required. However, in the meantime, the National Self-Exclusion Register is just one measure of the national framework for which the Commonwealth Government is responsible. And self-exclusion is a consumer protection tool aimed at individuals who are at risk of or who are already experiencing significant levels of harm from online wagering. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Coalition MP Andrew Wallace has recently advocated for a ban on the use of credit cards for online bets and met with major banks who are all apparently, and I'll quote, in furious agreement that action is needed. And in fact, in the story of a week ago, uh, the ANZ Bank is uh, quoted as being 100% um, uh, in agreement. Has the government met with any particular bank on this issue? And you did state that uh, you were also meeting with the ABA. And what action Order. has been taken? Senator Griff, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Griff, I personally haven't met with any bank on this particular issue, but as we said, Senator Fletcher and uh, Minister Fletcher and Minister Rustin will be meeting with the a ABA, who represent the banks collectively, and will be discussing this issue further. In the meantime, the National Self-Exclusion Register, as I said, is only one measure. In 2019, legislation passed in this very place to enable the establishment of that register, and the register will allow those who are experiencing gambling harm to immediately exclude themselves from the service services that are offered by all interactive wagering service providers with the click of one button. So the implementation of this register is very much on track. The request for tender is currently underway to select an organisation to operate that register. And although many individual Australian interactive gambling providers currently offer consumers the option to exclude themselves from opening an account with that particular provider, there is no national self-exclusion system available that applies to all providers. So this is a significant leap forward. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. In reflecting on the tens of thousands of women who marched for justice across the country, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, not far from here, such marches, even now, are being met with bullets. This morning, the Minister for Women said the observation was, and I quote, an important one. 
Is the Minister for Women really endorsing the Prime Minister when he tells Australian women they should feel lucky that they weren't shot? Order. I'll call the minister when they I'll call the minister when I have the opportunity to hear her. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Order. Order across the chamber. Reset the clock and I'll commence it when I call the minister again. Order. Order. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. In a democracy, Order. in a democracy like Australia, in a democracy like Australia, Mr. President, there are a number of rights, responsibilities, and privileges that I think many, many Australians overwhelmingly treasure and value. Yeah. One Order. of those, Mr. President, is the opportunity to protest peaceful demonstrations and peaceful exercises like the one that was undertaken yesterday. Unfortunately, Mr. President, there are too many countries around the world where those privileges, those rights are not extended. Too many countries Order. where democratic values that underpin Senator our Keneally, democratic Senator system Pratt. are not extended to Order. many, many Sorry, Senator people. Payne, I'm, going to ask you to cease. I'm going to ask senators that when I do use their names to at least have some break before they start breaching standing orders again. Senator Payne. Those democratic values, Mr President, are not extended to their populations. And in that regard, Australia is a fortunate country. Not very far from here, Mr President, in a number of places around and in a number Order. of places around the world where we have seen recent activities of protest and demonstration, we have seen those met by violence from authorities. Order. And Senator in that Pratt. case, Mr President, the values of the Australian democracy should be at the forefront of all of our minds. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Senator Keneally, a Thank you, Mr question. President. Even Senator Rennick, on the minister's own side, said that the Minister for Women should have attended yesterday's march for justice. Is Senator Rennick wrong? And does the Minister for Women stand by her decision not to attend the March for Justice yesterday? Senator Payne. Senator Watt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I uh, answered that question in here yesterday. I answered that question again last night, and I answered it again this morning. And frankly, Mr. President, uh, I want to reiterate the offer of the Prime Minister that still stands to meet with the organisers of yesterday's protest and order. rally. It's Senator, an offer that Senator the Prime Payne, Minister continues Senator to Keneally extend. Senator on a point of order. Um, Senator Keneally. Uh, with respect, I'm not sure how the relevance, I'm not sure how the minister can claim she answered a question yesterday to an event that only happened today. That is that Senator Rennick said today she should have attended the event. Um, is Senator Rennick wrong? Senator Keneally, the question also asked whether the minister stood by the decision they made. And I think with respect, the minister is being directly relevant to that uh, question concluded. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Guess we won't know if Senator Rennick is wrong. Political reporter Brett Worthington said this morning, and I quote, for the tens of thousands of Australian women who rallied around the nation, they were looking for signs that the nation's leaders were listening. What they heard was a prime minister who said they should be thankful they weren't shot. When will the Morrison government start listening to women, stop telling them they should feel lucky that they aren't shot, and start taking their concerns Order, seriously. Order, Senator Keneally. Senator Payne. Mr President, a number of uh, issues in recent weeks in this parliament and elsewhere, uh, including, may I say, some of the very impactful speeches made by people like Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, uh, speeches made, including at uh, yesterday's rally, Mr President, have 
have led to a very significant debate in this country about matters that go to the core of a number of, um, of fundamental issues for Australian women. And in that context, Mr President, we have taken a number of steps as a parliament. And for a period, those opposite engaged constructively and positively with the Minister for Finance, Special Minister of State, uh, in his efforts to ensure that this parliament is provided with an independent review to, to be carried out by the Sex Discrimination Order, Commissioner. Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister advise on how the Liberal National Party Government's economic recovery plan is working to support families, households, businesses and jobs as our economy recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Abetz for his question. I know he's champion endlessly uh, of the opportunities for job creations for Australians across Tasmania, but right across our land. And indeed, as Australia continues to recover from the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression, we can be buoyed by the continuing progress that is being made, particularly by the strength of consumer and business confidence. The NAB's measure of business confidence in February remained well above its long-run average level. All elements of Westpac's Consumer Sentiment Index have improved over the last year, and consumer confidence is up some 21.6 per cent over the year, close to a 10-year high. The latest OECD economic outlook suggests, Mr President, that the Australian economy declined by only 2.5 per cent in 2020, a significant improvement on the IMF's October forecast, and indeed a vast, vastly better outcome than, for example, the US at 3.5 per cent decline, the euro area at 6.5 per cent decline, or the UK at effectively a 10 per cent decline. And indeed, our recovery was showing great strength through the final two quarters of last year, and in the December quarter, real GDP increased by 3.1 per cent, leading the OECD to upgrade its forecast for Australia's economic growth in 2021 to 4.5 per cent, a significant lift from their forecast just back in December. Australia is one of just nine countries to have a AAA credit rating from all three of the ratings agencies. And all of this strength in our recovery is translating most crucially into jobs. Jobs for Australians that are seeing employment growth, unemployment decreasing to 6.4 per cent, 94 per cent of the jobs lost at the start of the pandemic having come back, and indeed the more than half of the jobs created in the last eight months pleasingly going Order. to women Senator across Australia. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that good news, especially on the jobs front, and I ask, can the minister also update the Senate on how the government's plan for lower taxes is putting money back into the pockets of our fellow Australians and helping to boost the nation's economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, indeed, our, tax, our income tax reforms as a government are a crucial part of the economic recovery that is occurring and the ongoing support that will be there for Australian households, not just this month or next month, but ongoing into the future. Our income tax cuts have already put some $9 billion back into the pockets of around 8.8 .8 million Australians, supporting economic recovery, driving consumer and business confidence. The Stage 2 tax cuts brought forward in last year's budget will deliver a further $12 billion boost to hard-working Australian taxpayers over the period from now through until September 2021. This means that someone earning around $60,000 will be paying more than $2,100 less tax compared to 2017-18. That's more money in their household to support spending, to support investment and to continue to drive the economic recovery forward. Order. Yeah. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the government's other measures will further support the transition to the next phase of our e economic recovery and any risks that Australia faces on our road to recovery? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, our direct economic and health support since the start of the pandemic now stands at some $267 billion. 
We have outlined the next targeted steps of investment to support parts of Australia, regional parts of Australia, industries in Australia who continue to face difficulties in relation to the pandemic. We have ongoing measures in place, but we are shifting in terms of the temporary and targeted nature to make sure we stick to those principles of proportionality outlined at the beginning. And can I welcome, in fact, the statement of the Leader of the Opposition today, where he said, we obviously do need to shift away. These mechanisms won't be in place forever. That indeed is very correct. Leader of the Opposition's uh, comments stand in contrast to the member for Maribyrnong, who happened to be out uh, in the media this morning, the former Leader of the Opposition. Oh, yes, he said, what's the point of tax cuts? What's the point of tax cuts? Well, Mr President, those on this side understand very clearly tax cuts put more money into the pockets Order. of Australians, give them more Order. capability to Senator support, Birmingham, to invest for the and to continue to support expired. our economy. Senator Birmingham. Senator, um, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Minister Colbeck. Minister, Spain, Germany, France, Cyprus, Italy, Portugal, Netherlands and Ireland have hit pause on the AstraZeneca rollout while they look into its potential links to blood clots. Your colleague, Senator Canavan, said today that Australia should follow suit. Why is the Minister for Health telling Australians there's no, there's, there's no need to worry when health officials in eight different countries are putting on the brakes? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. Um, as I said earlier in question time today, the government continues to follow the advice of Australia's world-leading therapeutic goods administration um, and, and also the other health authorities that advise us and have advised us so successfully through the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in this circumstance, ATAGI, who provide advice to us, um, has put out a statement noting the suspension of AstraZeneca in other countries. Uh, but it's also noted as a part of that statement that the rates of throm thrombotic events are not higher in the vaccine recipients than the expected background rate. Now, Mr President, the, these events are an issue that health authorities do keep an eye on as a part of the process. Uh, and our authorities here in Australia maintain and uh, continuous and close contact with authorities in Europe, particularly the EMA uh, and the MHRA, the UK authorities, where over 11 million doses have been dispensed of the AstraZeneca vaccine without seeing an incidence of increase of these sorts of events. So we maintain close contact with those authorities and the government continues to act on the advice of the TGA, ATAGI, and the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Professor Kelly, uh, in uh, continuing a safe rollout of this vaccine across the country, which we all acknowledge is extremely important uh, for the health of the Australian community, but also the economic recovery of the Australian economy from the COVID-19 virus. So we continue to act on that professional advice. Uh, and that's the advice that we will follow as the rollout continues and, uh, and the government believes that that's the appropriate process to follow. Sen Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This isn't just about science, this is about trust. And Australians didn't trust the Minister for Health enough to sign onto the COVID Safe app. He spent 14 million on that app and half of that was on advertising. A year later, and it's only found a handful of COVID contacts. If Australians didn't trust the Health Minister enough to put an app on their phones, why would they trust him enough to put a vaccine in their arms? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, um, Senator Lambie, in my, through you, Mr President, uh, in my answer to the last question, my references with respect to who Australians should listen to uh, and who they should trust with respect to this vaccine is the government, but via the advice that we received, that we have all received from the TGA, uh, ATAGI, uh, and people like the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Kelly, and of course, uh, ably assisted and led through the Department of Health by Professor Murphy, uh, who's the Secretary of the Department and who's been leading the process of uh, the vaccination rollout. Mr President, Senator Lambie is quite correct. This is a very, very important process for us. We need to maintain trust in the process, which is why, which is why we continue to rely 
on the advice of ATAGI, of the TGA and the CMO Order. in Colbeck. close contact with Time European the authorities. Expired. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. People in this building can deny it not until they're blue in the face, but the reality is, and this is the reality, that there's a growing lack of trust in the vaccine that's going on out there. People are saying they're losing confidence that the vac vaccines we have in Australia are safe and effective. Why have we tied the fate of our economic recovery to the success of the AstraZeneca vaccine, to the point where we're all forced to say everything's fine while the vaccine itself is starting to roll off the rails? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, um, I thank Senator Lambie for the question, but I wouldn't agree with the, the assertion that she placed uh, at the end of her question. Uh, the vaccination process in this country is continuing to ramp up. Uh, we are continuing to receive supplies of uh, both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccine, and other vaccines may come online to support the vaccination of Australians as the approval process continues. As we uh, get access, say, through the COVAX mechanism, where we do have uh, capacity coming online, Mr President. And so Australians can be confident. And, Mr President, I have to say, uh, in my experience and the feedback that I've been getting, for example, from aged care facilities, there is significant confidence and significant Order. demand, Order. Mr President. Significant Order. demand from senior Australians for uh, the Order. vaccination process, where we have over 40,000 Australians who have currently been vaccinated in over 500 aged care facilities. So there is, there is strong demand Senator in Colbeck, my experience time for the, the vaccination answer has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. The government promised new school teaching materials on consent and respectful relationships back in the 2015 plan for women's safety. But the Education Minister only announced the rollout in classrooms last week, a six-year delay. A student could have started and finished primary school in that time. Has the Minister for Women taken any action to find out why these important materials have been so delayed? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I don't have um, details with me of uh, the education aspects um, of, uh, of that matter. I am aware that uh, the Minister for Education did, in his remarks last week, uh, make reference uh, to these issues and to the bravery of the young women in particular who had come forward uh, as a result of, uh, as a result of uh, the discussion of these uh, very, very difficult issues in Australia, including sexual assault uh, and rape, uh, to uh, disclose their own experiences. As I understand it, we have uh, education materials in relation to the teaching of uh, primary and secondary students uh, about ethical behaviour, about consent and respectful relationships through what is known as the Respect Matters program, uh, and that that material will be freely available for use in all Australian schools in the coming weeks. Uh, the program for Foundation to Year 6, Mr President, is focused on uh, relationships and friendships uh, and managing these through changes and challenges. Uh, that is about providing building blocks for later content. Uh, the program for years seven to nine focuses on moving from preteen to adolescence and looks at relationships and power and bullying and bystander action. Uh, and then further, Mr President, the program for years 10 to 12 uh, focuses on personal and intimate relationships that includes understanding, consent and decision-making uh, and consent laws and rights. Mr President, the government understands that this is a much broader issue than just schools and significant funding has been allocated uh, since 2013 by governments, uh, federal and, uh, and state and territory. Uh, but a billion dollars from the Commonwealth to, pre Order. to prevent Senator and Payne, respond to violence time against for the women and their children. Has expired. But Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President, can the Minister for Women confirm she has failed to implement the recommendations in the 2016 COAG report on reducing violence against women and their children, and the 2018 statement from delegates at the COAG summit on reducing violence against women and their children? If yes, why? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As the Senator would be aware, um, we as a government, like previous governments, in fact commencing in 2010 
with a strong um, multi-partisan, I would say, support, Mr President, uh, have been supporters of, engaged in, leading on the National Action Plan to prevent violence against women and their children. Part of that is underpinned by the engagement of women's safety ministers from the states and territories with the Commonwealth ministers, Minister Rustin uh, and I at, uh, at, or, and myself at, uh, at this point in time. And that is, uh, that is the framework under which uh, the Commonwealth works and the states and territories work uh, on all of these issues. Uh, in relation to those individual reports, Mr President, if I have anything further to add, I will bring further information to the chamber. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. The CEO of Community Legal Centres Australia has warned that the government's move to abolish the specialist family court model risks, and I quote, exposing survivors of family violence to unnecessary risk. What action did the Minister for Women take to protect women and children from the risk of Attorney General Porter's move to abolish the family court? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And as um, senators would be aware, there was a very extensive consultation uh, on the introduction of the uh, reforms to the, uh, to the courts that Senator McCarthy has uh, alluded to. And this is a a, a very important priority for the government within the, uh, the family law system. I understand there's also been a report released uh, this week in relation to, uh, to uh, matters affecting uh, the court system and specifically with relation to, uh, to family law. There's a number of initiatives, uh, Mr President, which were uh, part of the Women's Economic Security Statement uh, as well in uh, October of last year uh, in the context of the budget. Uh, that also went to these issues in the context, uh, of course, at the time, overwhelmingly of, um, uh, of uh, COVID-19. Yesterday, in uh, discussions with a uh, number of community organisation representatives, including uh, uh, Ms Lynch from the uh, Women's Legal Service, if I have her, the title of the organisation correct, uh, in Queensland, a number Payne, of these matters were raised, Mr President. The answer has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, regional communities rely on aviation services to support, to support small business, tourism and the residents who live there to access employment opportunities as well as vital services such as medical treatment and education. Virgin has previously withdrawn services from regional areas and then in the last week of February, Rex Airlines announced plans to cut some of its regional services. This has concerned many rural and regional Australians reliant on these vital services. Can the minister please outline how the Liberal and National Government is supporting regional aviation to maintain as many of these essential air services, not only for tourism, but also for the viability of our communities in rural and regional Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. And Mr President, without a doubt, 2020 uh, presented the domestic aviation network uh, with the greatest challenges uh, it has ever faced. And uh, the Morrison McCormack government, uh, we were proud to support the domestic aviation network through these challenges. And uh, that was actually demonstrated again last week. Uh, when we announced a $1.2 billion package to support the tourism sector, to encourage more Australians to have a holiday domestically, but in particular in regional Australia. Mr President, we know that when the pandemic first hit, aviation, without a doubt, was hit and it was hit hard. The government at that time we put in place key supports to keep essential services running throughout the pandemic, not only to support regional airlines, but also ensuring that they can keep as many jobs as possible, Senator Davey, that are actually supported um, by our regions. Currently there are around 12 commercial regional airlines which operate regular scheduled passenger services across Australia. It's almost one year today 
that the government announced its initial package to assist regional airlines to support critical air services to regional and rural communities, securing access to critical medical supplies and testing, securing freight and securing transport of essential personnel through the Regional Aviation Support Program. Mr President, you'd also be aware that the government provided an additional $100 million uh, in funding to directly support the smaller regional airlines if they need it. And the reason we did this is because those regional airlines are critical supports for regional communities, providing critical aeromedical services and links to capital and metropolitan areas for medical appointments, medical freight and locum doctors. Um, and certainly we are committed to ensuring that these services continue. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. So the 1.2 billion Tourism Aviation Network Support Program, or TANS, as uh, my leader likes to call it, um, announced last week and will initially service 13 key tourism regions. But can the minister please outline the future measures that our government will undertake to promote tourism and maintain and the maintenance of key air services in the regions not currently included in that program? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, prior to COVID-19, Australians spent approximately $65 billion on overseas travel in 2019. This presents now enormous opportunities uh, for our regions. That's $65 billion in 2019 on overseas travel. What we are doing as a government is supporting more Australians to back our regions and to support Australians to holiday at home this year. We have announced, as you know, the half price ticket program last week, which will initially operate in over 13 key regions, with the potential for more regions to be added on the basis of consumer demand, consultation and the success of the program. Mr President, in addition to this, the vital domestic aviation policies that are supporting our regional airlines, regional health systems and regional jobs they will continue for six months from the end of March to the end of September 2021. Again, as a Order. government, Senator we will Cash, always time back for the our has regions. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Yes. Can the minister please outline how Australians living in regional areas, and not just the holidaymakers who live in our capital cities, will be able to access the subsidised airline tickets under the program? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, all Australians, all Australians will have access to these fares through airline websites and booking agents in the coming weeks for flight bookings from the 1st of April. The discounts will be offered on tens of thousands of fares per week across an initial 13 key tourism regions, uh, and the government is working with airlines to increase the number of flights uh, to these tourism areas. Mr President, not only will regional Australians benefit, but regional airlines, regional accommodation providers, regional restaurants and bars and regional tourism operators. They will all benefit from the policy put in place by the government. But in particular, I would encourage all Australians, Order. if you are considering taking advantage of the discount fare, book through a travel agent. Book through a travel agent, not just to support the local business, but also to ensure that you can actually make the Order. most of your travel and experience in terms of what all of our regions have to offer. Uh, doing this will Order. obviously support those local travel Order, agent Senator businesses. Senator Cash, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to reports that key components of the Attorney General Christian Porter's job will be delegated to others upon his return from leave on 31 March. Are the reports correct? What responsibilities will be delegated? Why are these regarded as areas in which Mr Porter will face a conflict of interest and who will be assisting Mr Porter? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank the Senator for her question. Um, uh, as, uh, as the Attorney General announced yesterday, he is, uh, he is exercising the same rights as any other Australian when they believe they have been defamed to initiate uh, legal proceedings uh, against certain organisations and individuals uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure appropriate handling whilst the Attorney General initiates such proceedings. The government has sought legal advice in relation to any issues that may arise as a result of the Attorney General filing such proceedings. As an interim measure, until that advice is received, 
The Attorney General's Office will have no engagement with the Federal Court, uh, which would be expected to hear the proceedings I understand, or involvement with matters involving the Federal Court or the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The Attorney General's Department has similarly been told not to engage with the Attorney General or the Attorney General's Office Order. in respect of matters involving the Federal Court or the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Order. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. The um, next meeting of the Attorneys General will be on the 31st of March, the day Mr Porter returns from leave, at which it will discuss two of its priorities, family violence, national information sharing framework and model defamation reform. Will Mr Porter attend the meeting and, if so, how will he manage his clear conflict of interest on two of the meeting's three identified priorities? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr President, uh, I'm not aware of what, uh, what Mr Porter's commitments will be on the 31st of March, and I'll take that on notice. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. It's reported that the Attorney-General's portfolio will be restructured to ensure Mr Porter is able to return to the role while he pursues defamation action. How long will a junior Attorney-General be required to assist Mr Porter to remain in Cabinet? While questions remain over whether he is a fit and proper person to resume full responsibilities. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. Order. President. As I said in relation to the primary question, the Attorney General is exercising the same rights as any Australian in relation to initiating defamation proceedings uh, in the belief that he has been defamed. Out of an abundance Order. of caution, the government has sought legal advice in relation to the Attorney-General's work as an interim measure until that advice has been received. The steps that I outlined in relation to the primary question will be undertaken. Once that advice is received, if there's any further information to add, I'll make sure that it's brought to the Chamber. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, Senator Keneally. Deputy President, uh, understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Sen Senator Birmingham, as to why 108 questions, 108 questions taken on notice since October 2019 remain unanswered. Uh, thank you. Do you uh, Senator Keneally, do you have a list of the questions or uh, does the Minister not need them at this point? I'll just uh, Senator Keneally, uh, pe people have, other senators have been reading them out, but if you haven't, I do not have a full list. Thanks. But I think the government would know the 108. Okay, the Minister. We, well, Deputy President, I understand Senator Keneally is uh, is seeking this explanation, understanding Order 74.5, uh, in which uh, in which uh, it clearly states that uh, that uh, the senator may ask uh, if uh, questions the senator has asked have not been responded, and may ask for an explanation for such. I am advised that Senator Keneally does not have any questions on notice through the estimates process that have not been responded to. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. I am here today representing— Sen uh, Senator Keneally, just a moment. Are you, uh, Sorry, just yes. to, if you take your seat, Minister. If, if, if you Senator, Keneally, Senator Keneally was not in order in the question that she sought and the explanation that she sought. She had no questions that are outstanding in relation to estimates procedures. And so, Deputy President, I ask you to rule that Senator Keneally's attempt to now take note of an explanation to a question that ought not have been asked is out of order. Uh, thank you, Minister. So I'm, uh, as I understand, uh, are you seeking? Uh, sorry, Senator Wong. Uh, Madam Deputy President, um, uh, I can give indication. I can get a senator down here because we have in excess of a hundred questions. All right. Would you like me to seek leave to make a short statement, Eric? I'm happy to do that. Senator Wong, I seek leave. Um, I'm speaking to the point of order. I know that. I'm, I'm making this point. I, th uh, I think that the leader of the government may be technically correct because we, we asked Senator Keneally, as the deputy leader, 
um, to make a contribution in relation to the excess of 100, and I'm yeah. hoping that someone is going to provide me with the schedule soon, as per my request. Mm -hmm. um, uh, questions which have been asked by Labor senators but not answered um, in, uh, yeah. or, or yeah. for estimates. Yeah. Uh, so we are seeking that she make this contribution as the deputy leader of the um, Labor Party of the opposition here in the Senate. Now, I would take advice from the clerk. I, I can't recall whether or not on behalf of Labor senators mm -hmm. is, has been permitted uh, in the standing orders. And if, if, if the ruling is different, I, I'm happy to just indicate we, we have Senators Polly, Gallagher, uh, McCarthy, um, Green, Kitching, I can go through this myself um, and Wong, many others. If, so, if the government wants yeah. to use the technicality to avoid a discussion about the extent to which they are avoiding parliamentary scrutiny, the, set, the leader of the government can take that debating point. The, the, the point is, the government is failing. Is failing. Will the standing orders also require you? you you're, you're, well, I'm responding um, to your Senator interjection. Wong. I know you're grumpy Senator today. Wong. I'm responding to your interjection. The Senator standing Wong. orders. Your standing orders, the standing orders also Senator require Wong. you, Senator also Wong. require you I to respond trying. to questions Senator on Wong. notice, and you're refusing you refusing to. Your seat. Thank you. I was going to respond uh, to the point of order, order to the point of order raised by the minister, and uh, inform the Senate that in fact Senator Keneally may ask in response to questions she has. Not had answered in the she believes haven't been answered in the required time, and she can ask on behalf of other Labor senators. But she needs to be clear in what she's requesting. Senator Keneally, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Standing Order 74.5C. I move that the Senate take note of the minister's failure to provide the answers to the 108 questions asked by Labor senators on notice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here we stand today in this chamber and this government trying to argue technicalities about standing orders. Well, understand this. Standing orders require the government to answer questions on notice and to answer them in a certain time frame. It is not a technicality to avoid accountability. It is your responsibility as a government to be answerable to this chamber. It is a responsibility of the government to be accountable to the questions posed by senators. And it is your responsibility as a government to conform to the standing orders. And the standing orders require the government to answer the questions posed by senators, including on notice. On notice, 108 questions sit unanswered by this government. Since October 2019, I hope that everyone watching this broadcast today understands that Senator Birmingham and the government he represents in this chamber have left 108 questions unanswered. They are turning their back on their accountability. As a government, they are turning their back on their accountability to this Senate. They are turning their back on their responsibility. And they are turning their back on the Australian people. Since October 2019, we are just days away from another week of estimates, where no doubt this list I have in my hand of 108 questions that are unanswered by this government, this government led in this chamber by Senator Birmingham, turning their back on their responsibility, arguing a technicality to try and keep me from making this contribution. A technicality, they say, in the standing orders. It's not a technicality for Senator Birmingham and his colleagues to answer the questions put to them on notice. Madam Deputy President, a fish rots from the head down. It is no surprise that apathy 
towards accountability, a willingness to turn your back on accountability, plagues the Morrison government, and it starts with the Prime Minister's office. I don't hold a hose, mate, said the Prime Minister. He doesn't hold an inquiry when serious allegations of rape are leveled as an Attorney General. And he doesn't hold out any hope for this chamber that the questions will be answered. What do we have here today? A government that is turning their back on accountability. A government that's turned around and said, no, we don't hold the hose. We don't hold responsibility. We don't hold seriously our accountability. 108 un unanswered questions, some dating back to October 2019. The Prime Minister is the worst offender. The minister who Simon Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, represents in this chamber is the worst offender in not answering questions on notice. It was Senator Birmingham who just moments ago tried to argue a technicality that I couldn't speak to this. And it is Senator Birmingham who's turning his back on his responsibilities to ensure that the minister he represents in this chamber, the prime minister, answers the questions on notice put to him by senators. As I said, we are days away from estimates. No doubt this list of 108 questions is going to grow. But it doesn't stop with the prime minister. There are another 40 seven questions overdue from the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications, which is led by the Deputy Prime Minister himself. There are another 25 questions overdue from Minister Rustin, who's also manager of government business in this place. We have the Prime Minister. We have the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. We have the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and transport. We have the Minister for Social Services in this chamber, Senator Rustin. These are the three biggest offenders in not answering questions on notice, on turning their back on accountability. Now we have seen this government turn its back in recent days and weeks, in fact in years, over seven years. This government has turned their back on the Australian people. They have left the Australian people behind, and they are leaving their responsibility to be accountable to this parliament and through this parliament to the Australian people. They're leaving that behind. Because understand this, a government that doesn't think they have a responsibility to answer questions under the standing orders is a government that no longer thinks it is accountable to this parliament or to the Australian people. Unfortunately, we don't just have the evidence of 108 answered, unanswered questions since October 2019. We also have the evidence of a government that has delivered a dodgy NBN, that has paid $30 million for airport land in Western Sydney that was only worth $3 million, of a government that has presided over sports rorts, handing out taxpayer money as if it is Liberal Party money to marginal seats on color-coded spreadsheets. We have a government that is willing to take the Safer Communities Fund and disregard and reject the legitimate safety needs of communities across Australia and instead put that money into marginal and liberal seats to make them safer for the Liberal Party. That is a government that has turned its back on the Australian people. That is a government that has turned its back on parliamentary responsibility. This is a government that promised a National Integrity Commission where is it? Where is it? It hasn't been delivered by the Attorney General Christian Porter. It remains in draft legislation because this government does not believe they need to be held accountable. They continue to turn their back on the scandals, on the incompetence, on the corruption. 
This is a government that can't even answer questions on notice, must, much less set up a National Integrity Commission to ensure that we don't have regional road rorts and safer communities rorts and sports rorts and dodgy land deals and a dodgy NBN. Distressingly this week, we've also seen that this government has turned its back on the Australian people and particularly Australian women. China. Australian women were out in force here in Canberra and in locations across the country. 110,000 women and men marched to say enough is enough because they want answers from this government. Where is the Respect at Work report and its 55 recommendations seeking to establish greater equality for Australian women? Where does it sit? It sits as work undone, unanswered by this government, like the 108 unanswered questions, the Respect at Work report. The government doesn't think they're accountable for that. They don't think they're responsible for that. We even heard the Minister for Women, Senator Payne, today say, oh, the private sector, the private sector. Is there nothing this government won't outsource to the private sector? Her claim, she didn't really have to get progressing. She didn't have to encourage the Attorney General to get going on that because the private sector had a lot of responsibility here. There are 55 recommendations to the government. Only three of them have been implemented. Only three. So again, we have a government turning its back on its responsibilities. During the last sitting period, the Senate ordered the production of answers to 631 overdue questions on notice from estimates hearings dating back to 2019. 631. Even when compelled by the Senate to finally answer these questions, there are ministers in this government, members of this very chamber, who just plainly refuse to do their jobs, who just turn their back on their responsibilities. And I know senators who have their back turned on me right now can hear me. They should face their responsibilities as leaders, as front benchers, and be accountable to the parliament. The fact that the Prime Minister is the number one offender when it comes to not answering questions on notice, not a surprise. This is a Prime Minister who thinks his job is political management, not management of the parliament, not management of policy, not management of good outcome for the Australian people, but management of his own political fortunes. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised as Senator Pratt interjects that a Prime Minister that is all about marketing and spin and headline and announcement and photo op couldn't be bothered to answer questions posed by the Senate. Because that's what he's about. He's about the management of the, his marketing brand, not about the management of the economy the management of our community, delivering good policy that ensures that women can be safe at work, even when their workplace is the Australian Parliament. This is a Prime Minister who offered to meet women behind closed doors rather than go out and cross the street to hear from thousands of women who had gathered here to say enough is enough. Perhaps none of us should have been surprised that the Prime Minister wouldn't cross the road. The Prime Minister won't even do his basic day job of answering questions on notice from the Senate, from the Parliament. I never thought, Madam Deputy President, we would one day long for the leading heights of ministerial accountability under Malcolm Turnbull. But frankly, I say bring them back. Bring them back. Because what we saw from the last secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet was that Dr. Parkinson took his role seriously. 
He thought the minister should be accountable for a portfolio. No doubt his boss, Malcolm Turnbull, impressed that upon him. Dr. Parkinson thought the Australian people deserved transparency and oversight from a government they elected. So this starts at the top. A commitment to accountability, a commitment to transparency, a commitment to just do your basic job. So what I want to say as we head into Estimates Week is a message not just to the ministers in this government, because I think we've made our point here. The ministers in this government have turned their back on their accountability. They've turned their back on this parliament, and they're turning their back on the Australian people. What I would like to say to any department secretaries who are appearing before estimates next week, it is the practice of Labor senators and front benchers to give notice to departments on the questions we want to ask, on the officials we would like to be there, on the matters we wish to explore. And we do that as a courtesy so that they may come prepared. So what I would like to say to department secretaries is to remind them of something I believe they know, that is that they are accountable to this parliament. And while ministers in the Morrison government may disregard and may feel that they are not accountable to the Australian people. They may turn their back on their responsibilities. Next week in Estimates, we expect answers to questions, not for our sake, but for the sake of parliamentary accountability, for the sake of the standing orders, for the sake of the Australian people. Because governments in a democracy are accountable to the people. Thank you, Senator Keneally. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to taking note of answers. Senator McCarthy. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Payne to the questions asked by Senators McAllister, Keneally and I. I rise to take note of the failure of this government to take substantive action against sexual harassment of women in the workplace and their failure to take real action against the violence and threat of violence women face every single day. They cannot even roll out a school program about respectful re relationships in a reasonable time frame. Not here in this country. These are the words of the Prime Minister yesterday in response to the thousands of women who rallied around Australia in protest against violence and harassment. To say enough is enough. To call for leadership, national leadership on this issue, which should be a turning point for gendered violence issues in this country. Instead, we get told we should be lucky, grateful even, that we aren't shot when, we're, when we take to the streets to protest this, that we should be grateful our cries of protest against violence aren't met with violence. Not good enough, not nearly good enough, because we have a history of meeting calls from women, pleas from women to stop the violence, of meeting these calls with violence, Women know this. First Nations women in particular know this. And I'm not going to talk about the statistics because I want to talk about the women. The people who, in their own words, aren't just numbers. Some of you may remember a group of First Nations women from Central Australia who came to Canberra three years ago to bring us their message about combating family violence and their calls for support. These women were from the Tungindjura Women's Family Safety Group and they spent days here in Parliament House meeting with senators, meeting with government ministers, telling all about the work they do on the front line of family violence in Alice Springs. And these women, Madam Deputy President, in 2017 organised the largest women's march in Central Australia to protest against and draw attention to violence against First Nations women. 
It was sparked by anger and frustration when one of the friends of the family was badly injured by an intimate partner. Yet her near death garnered no headlines, no comment, no outrage. However, more than 300 people joined in the Alice Springs action to highlight Aboriginal women and children and families who are living with, injured by or dying from violence. They then made the decision to bring their message here to Canberra and to show First Nations women all over the country that we can stand up and be heard, that we do have the solutions and need to be part of the decision making. These remarkable and strong women came to Canberra and they made an impact. Madam Deputy President, one of these women, a core member of the group, a woman who was dedicated to changing lives, to working to combat violence against women, well, I attended her funeral on Friday. Mm. She was killed earlier this year after being run down in a car allegedly driven by her partner. And she was killed outside the Alice Springs Hospital, a place where people go to seek help and healing. And she was killed despite her work advocating that the voices of First Nations women need to be heard. When she came to Canberra and asked us to listen and stand with her and the other women who flew all the way, and for many of them it was the first time, first time out of Alice Springs, they wanted us to hear their solutions, acknowledge their experience and recognise the important work that is being done on a community level to deal with issues of domestic and family violence. And she urged the government to listen to a wide range of First Nations voices regarding family and domestic violence issues and commit to genuine collaboration and partnerships with women at the community level when making family and domestic violence policies. So yesterday, when hundreds of thousands of men and women marched across this country thinking, reflecting on their own experiences and those of people that they know and love, well, I remembered her, knowing that she came here three years ago to ask this government to act. And three years later, we still have a government that won't listen, that won't act, and turns its back, just like we saw today. Thank you, uh, Senator McAllister. Senator Macdonald. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers. I am going to find it hard to get through this take note today because we, as women of the coalition, have a part of women of Australia, and we all share in the, in the distress, the anguish and the horror of sexual assaults right across this land, right across this land. Yesterday, I was scheduled to speak here in the chamber and was not able to be there for the start of the march. I committed to going down to lending my, my presence to the issue of sexual assault in workplaces right across this land. I listened to the words spoken by Senator McCarthy and I too am frustrated and horrified by the ongoing assaults, particularly in Indigenous communities, but right across my part of the world in northern Queensland. I spend time with the Women's Centre with Yumba Meta in Townsville, understanding their challenges, the role that they play in supporting victims, both men and women. And yet, I find myself today somehow not quite good enough a woman. Somehow I find myself today not woman enough to be included by the opposition. You would think that our shared experiences would in some way bind us. But instead, I find myself again part 
of not being of being my voice being taken away and the people I represent being taken away. I weep that we are politicising an issue that should never, should never be in this chamber in somehow holding the people, individuals who have no part in these assaults. Good men, good women, and yet we have to be lectured to on not being woman enough because I do stand with the victims of these assaults. I am horrified and outraged that this should happen, this should still be happening in this land. And it is not just in Parliament, it is in workplaces, communities, homes, hospitals, retirement villages. And yet instead of standing together, instead of being a bipartisan event to try and stamp this out, to, to educate, to uh, provide resources, we are going to turn this into another, another way of dividing us. I am disappointed beyond words because when I go and speak to communities and women's centres and men's centres, this is not the, the story that I want to take back, that we are not united, that there is not a, a deep desire to see sexual assaults in this land finish. And this government has committed funding to centres, has spoken on this, has provided resources in every state and territory. And the next person who seeks to politicise this by making this in somehow the responsibility of some people who are not the right sort not the right gender, not the right colour, not the right party, not the right region, should be ashamed because they perpetuate this attack on the very people that we should be working together with. I thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Um, Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Notes by acknowledge um, Senator Macdonald's attendance and also others from the other side, because where the apology really should be going, and that is to the fact that the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Minister for Women didn't attend the rally. And that's where the politicisation has occurred. By not saying this is a bipartisan support for making sure that the voice of women and the serious, serious matters that we're dealing with right now in this place is dealt with appropriately. And as we've seen over the last eight years, the government has once again failed to rise to the occasion before it. Yesterday, hundreds of thousands of courageous Australian women around the country embarked on the historic March for Justice. In stark contrast to the limp excuses put forward by those opposite in recent weeks, we heard powerful, brilliant speeches by incredible women. Incredible women like Brittany Higgins and incredible women like Grace Tammy. And for the 12 million Australian men, whether your job is to listen, our job is to listen, whether you join the protest in the streets around the country or not. But for those carrying in this building, as the Prime Minister chose to do, you need to listen. Because, of course, for men and women in the Morrison government, you have the power to do so much more. But instead of rising to the occasion, instead of seizing this opportunity to take a stand against the pandemic of sexual harassment in this country and in this building, instead, the Prime Minister has proactively obstructed and undermined those seeking long overdue justice. The Prime Minister refused to meet the rally 
just outside these doors. The Deputy Prime Minister refused to meet the rally just outside these doors. The Minister for Women refused to meet the rally just outside these doors. Instead, the Prime Minister declared it a triumph that these courageous women were not, I quote, met with bullets. The Prime Minister believes that the women of Australia should be content that they can protest without being murdered in the streets and should be satisfied with that. What a lofty ambition the Prime Minister has of Australia has for the women of this country. And of course, it's hardly surprising. When the same Prime Minister announced he could only sympathise with Brittany Higgins because he is a father. No one will ever say it better than that the Australian of the Year, Grace, uh, Grace Taman, did at the National Press Club. It should take having children to have a conscience. It shouldn't take children to have a conscience. Having children doesn't guarantee a conscience. Indeed, it does not. Because this is a government which sends senior cabinet ministers on indefinite paid leave, hoping that their scandals will blow over, such as the Minister for Defence, who failed her duty of care to her staff member, who mishandled the most serious claim of misconduct of sexual assault, which has ever taken place in this building, who called Brittany Higgins, who has displayed such incredible courage in coming forward, not just for herself, but for victims of sexual assault around Australia, a lying cow. And who only apologised for that remark upon threat of a defamation lawsuit. This is conduct unbecoming any manager or employer, let alone a federal cabinet minister. And of course, speaking of lawsuits, we have the Attorney General who announced yesterday, while on indefinite paid leave at that time, that he was suing the ABC journalist who revealed the allegations made against him. Rather than taking accountability and doing the right thing, rather than standing down the Attorney-General pending an independent inquiry. Of course, the government instead is attacking the media. The only legal action the Morris government is taking on these rape allegations is not against the Attorney-General. The only legal action being taken is against a female journalist for having the audacity for doing her job. This is a disgraceful approach, but one which is consistent with the attitude towards women by the Morrison government. In 2003, when the Governor-General, Peter Hollingsworth, was accused of rape, the Prime Minister stood him down pending the investigation. What's happening with the Attorney-General? Thank you, uh, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. People listening into this debate will see a great distinction between the contribution of Senator Macdonald and those from the other side. Senator Macdonald's contribution, poignant, considered and oozing with wise counsel. Very, very considered, not seeking to play the cheap political card. The issues that we are dealing with are sensitive, people's lives are at stake, women's lives and also those that are accused. And we always have to keep that in balance and in mind. And so when Senator Sheldon makes his uh, contribution about the Attorney General, he of course does not reflect on his former leader, similarly accused. And we on this side have accepted the fact that it was investigated and the appropriate authorities determined not to proceed with it. The same standard ought be applying to the Attorney-General. Indeed, if it is asserted by those opposite that somehow, because the police haven't proceeded, there should be a judicial inquiry into behaviour, might I add, that is alleged whilst the attorney was still a minor, why not have an inquiry similarly in into the behaviour of the member for Maribyrnong? There's no answer to that, is there, from the opposition, because they seek to play politics with this very, very important issue. And, Madam Deputy President, as somebody that volunteered his services, 
to help establish a women's shelter. I was on the inaugural committee. I was the honorary legal advisor for many years and still have an interest in this area. I know the pain and the suffering that is inflicted upon the women folk of this country and I sought to do something about it from my own resources and my own capacities, along might I add, with a group of wonderfully dedicated individuals, both male and especially female. Violence toward each other should be condemned full stop. Violence by physically stronger people against physically weaker people is abhorrent, and so it is usually with violence by men against women, and it needs to be condemned outright. Indeed, I've said before, I'll say it again, that talking about domestic violence, I think, demeans that which actually goes on. Domestic violence is actually assault. It's a crime. It should be treated as a crime and not dressed up as something which is sort of somewhat a bit different to an assault because it happened to occur at home. These things need to be considered very carefully, very maturely. And Senator McCarthy, very disappointing in her speech contribution, sought to condemn the federal government as though the Northern Territory Labor government had no legislative responsibility or capacity in this area. It does. We know it does. But why only seek to blame the federal Liberal government for insufficient activity when the problem may well lie in the Northern Territory government? I don't seek to do that. I seek to say to everybody in this chamber and Australia that trying to blame a Liberal government or a Labor government or this person or that person is to play cheap politics with a very, very important issue. It demeans those that seek to do it. And I rely again in concluding, Madam Deputy President, on the words, the very wise words of my friend and colleague, Senator Susan MacDonald, who was able to express her point of view and her disappointment at the way she herself has been handled in this debate and many other good men and women. Let's all work together to achieve an outcome to ensure that everybody is safe in our community, especially our women folk. Thank you, uh, Senator Bitt. Senator Ayres. What the uh, questions today and the answers today in question time really revealed was the entire absence, the invisibility of this Minister for Women. Uh, not, just, not just over the last three or four weeks, but over the last two years uh, of her being in that position. There are enormous challenges that Australian women face. More women than men lost jobs during the COVID-19 period. The new jobs <coughs> that have been created that the government celebrates so much have largely been casual and low-wage jobs, mostly women's jobs. Uh, so not only have Australian women been hit by the biggest impact of COVID-19 in terms of losing their jobs, uh, but the jobs that have been created have been low-quality jobs. The gender wage gap persists. Nearly 900 deaths since 208 uh, caused by domestic and family violence. The scourge of violence against women and children, I am not convinced it's got any better over that period. And there is much to suggest that it's getting worse. And just latterly, the revelations of an alleged rape, not very far from the Prime Minister's office, uh, the, the misogyny that exists in some quarters in this parliament, a parliament that should be the exemplar for Australian people, not one of the worst kind of workplaces for Australian women. 
The unequal position of women in this country diminishes all of us. I absolutely reject the mean-spirited values that underpin the Prime Minister's statement where he said he was all for inequality just as long as men didn't have to go backwards in the process. The great irony of that statement is that the only reason that the gender wage gap has shrunk by a tiny amount is because the Prime Minister's wage policy, his industrial relations policies, have driven the wages of blue-collar men down over the course of the last couple of years. Violence diminishes us all. Unequal pay diminishes us all. Disrespect at work diminishes us all. Misogyny diminishes us all. And where on earth, amidst all of this, is the invisible Minister for Women? Yesterday, 10,000 women and thousands of men gathered outside. Now, I acknowledge those coalition uh, members and senators who came out as well. Where was the Minister for Women? Hiding over there in this chamber, invisible outside, a confected excuse for, sta for staying in here. How can she possibly rationalise the decision uh, to stay away from that rally? She is supposed to be the Minister for Women. She is supposed to be an advocate for change. She is supposed to be finding ways through policy and politics and this place to lift the status of women. But where was she? Nowhere. And there's been plenty of opportunity. The Respect at Work report more than 12 months ago, basic steps, basic steps in that report to elevate the position of Australian women and protect them at work, almost zero. Three out of 55, almost zero response from this government. The events over the course of the last three or four weeks that have laid bare just how weak the government's response is when faced by the kind of allegations that Ms Higgins has brought forward, that others have brought forward, that have been forward, brought forward against the Attorney-General in this place. And the government's response has been entirely about political management, not protecting the interests of women, not dealing with issues on its merits, an entirely political response. And where has the Minister for Women been? Entirely invisible. In terms of ministers for women in this place, we've had two years of Tony Abbott as the Minister for Women, two years of Senator Cash as the Minister for Women, two years of Kelly O'Dwyer as the Minister for Women, and now we've had two long years of Minister Payne. And I am not convinced which of those two year periods has been the worst, characterised by the least action characterised by the total invisibility Thank of this you, minister. Thank uh, you, Senator Ayres. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McCarthy to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response to my question regarding the Christchurch massacre. And sorry, who was that to, Senator Faruqi? Uh, to Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Two years ago yesterday, an Australian man walked into two mosques in Christchurch, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and killed 51 innocent Muslims. This was an attack the New Zealand Royal Commission ended up confirming, driven by an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. I remember exactly where I was that day, just as I'm pretty sure every Muslim in this part of the world remembers exactly where they were. It was shattering. Our hearts broke as we came to understand the enormity of the hate-filled massacre. In June of 2019, just a few months after the mosque attacks, I travelled to Christchurch to visit the Al Nur Mosque and meet with communities and families. Two years on, how far have we come to ensure this will never happen again? not nearly far enough. In fact, we have arguably gone further down the wrong path. Open racism and Islamophobia continue to be tolerated and even encouraged in politics and media. Neo-Nazis and far-right white nationalists organize online, their toxic hatred seeping into mainstream public discussions. 
Muslims continue to experience racism wherever we go. I have pushed hard against this, as have many advocates, but Australia's lack of progress remains deeply concerning to me. I worry that without substantial political change, the next Christchurch attack will not be a matter of if, but when. I have been disturbed to read the initial submissions to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Inquiry into Extremism. All key government agencies, including ASIO, the AFP, and Home Affairs, have indicated in their initial submissions to the inquiry that the threat of far-right extremism is growing. However, substantial policy change and political action is nowhere to be seen. The unanimity of federal authorities on the growing threat of far-right extremism stands in sharp contrast to the dismissive rhetoric of government MPs. We heard in the response to my questions earlier much of the same rhetoric, refusing to squarely target far-right extremism. When I put to the minister a very simple yes or no question about whether the government would condemn far-right extremism without equivocation, I did not receive a yes or no response. Senator Birmingham responded by saying he would condemn far-right and religious extremism and all forms of extremism without qualification. The minister would not condemn far-right extremism in isolation. This is the extremism which drove the massacre in Christchurch, and it needs to be condemned. As I said earlier in my question to the minister, ASIO states in its submission to the PJCIS inquiry that the threat from extreme right-wing groups has increased, with groups being more organized and sophisticated than before. Conversely, on left-wing extremism, ASIO states that it is not currently prominent in Australia, but there is no acknowledgement of this clear contrast from the government. In fact, MPs continue to promote false equivalences. The Liberals have completely failed here, not just in their rhetoric, but also their actions. Laws on extremist hatred must be strengthened and enforced. There are still no dedicated programs for tackling far-right extremism in the community and no commitment to an anti-racism strategy or campaign. When MPs have their heads in the sand or even tacitly endorse far-right ideas, it totally undermines the government's response to this threat. The government has been dragged into the PJCIS inquiry, kicking and screaming, and even deflected a clear-eyed focus on far-right extremism and white supremacy. Now, once they have received submissions from our security agencies, they continue to deflect and deny. They have no choice but to look at the evidence and respond accordingly. Thousands of Muslims in Australia and other targeted communities of color are counting on them, are begging them to take this seriously. This week, we remember the 51 lives lost in Christchurch and the many injured and families whose worlds were changed forever in March 2019. We work to ensure that their passing was not in vain. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.